Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Device Location. This training is brought to you by Commercial Electronics. If you would like to learn more about our recording solution, third-party quality assurance services, or our Carbine 911 call handling solution, visit comelectronics.com. This webinar is part of our public safety education series, and you can view our upcoming webinars on our training page at comelectronics.com slash training. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you're listening in using your computer speaker system, you're automatically muted to eliminate background noise. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the handset in the audio pane at the bottom right and the dial-in information will be displayed. You can submit questions about today's lesson at any time by typing your questions into the Q&A pane of the control panel and Paul will address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now, after the presentation, you'll receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. For those wanting to report this training to their state certification or licensing agency, send an email to training at comelectronics.com. Your instructor today is Paul Tetro, Vice President of Strategic Partners with Carbine 911. He's an entrepreneur, with Carbine being his second startup in public safety. He's a published author of two books, Blockchain Unchained and The Illustrated Guide to Understanding Blockchain. He lives with his wife of 43 years in New Jersey. I'm Beth English. I'm program manager of the Quality Assurance Program and Higher Ground Trainer for Commercial Electronics. So thank you for joining us, Paul. I'm going to let you take it from here. Thanks, Beth. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, appreciate you taking some time to learn a little bit about uh, device location and how it works uh, on a mobile call. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Carbine. I'm going to give you one slide, a little bit of an overview of who Carbine is. Um, we are probably one of the most innovative companies in the whole call taking uh, space uh, and in the public safety space. Uh, our ecosystem uh, can support not only voice but data and other information flowing into the emergency communication centers. And one of the things that we've done a lot of work with is taking all this information and putting it into a, a display that is usable. Uh, so if you're a, a call taker, you don't have to look at five different screens. Everything has been consolidated onto one screen, and you can click on and off different information as you see appropriate. Carbine was founded in 2014, and we have over 100 people in the company, seven offices around the world. We serve over 70 agencies currently, uh, and our solutions handle more than 4.5 million calls a month. Uh, for, uh, uh, for a population of 230 million people. So um, we're looking, obviously, for um, more uh, of an install base in the United States. Um, and let me talk to you today about our topics. Our first topic is what, what types of calls come into 911. We'll take a look at that. We're then going to talk about how location is calculated, we'll start out by reviewing the, the old um, network location that everyone's familiar with, Phase 2 Wireless, and then we'll look at what Google and Apple do to actually calculate a location based on the device that you're holding and exactly where you're standing. Um, we'll then look at the device location workflow, so in the cloud, so to speak, how does all this information fly around? Where does it go? What has to happen? And how does it get back to the 911 centers? And then finally, we'll do a little summary about everything that we've talked about, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the, the session. So let's start with the calls to 911. As most of you, especially if you're a telecommunicator, you probably already know that 60% of the calls that come into 911 are admin calls. Another 32% of the calls that come in to 911 are actual calls to 911. 
And probably, uh, I know Beth and I chatted about this uh, when we did our little rehearsal, probably only 10% of those are actual real emergencies. A lot of people use 911 to find out, you know, what time the uh, city hall is open and, and other kind of frivolous things. Um, but uh, the, the, the calls that come into the center, they have to be dealt with as though they were uh, an actual emergency. And then we still have landlines out there. About 8% of the calls come from landlines, and, and that number shrinks um, every year. Uh, I'm wondering, I, I know I don't have a landline. Beth and I talked about this before the session. She doesn't have a landline. I'm sure many of you uh, in the audience today do not have a landline as well. Also remember that with admin calls, location is not supported. So the only time a location is sent and we'll see the various ways that it is sent, but the only time it is sent is if you dial 911. If you call the 10-digit admin line and it ends up being an emergency, there's no location that's sent on those admin calls unless, of course, you have a, a carbine solution. So of all of those calls, about 85% are made from mobile devices, and again, that number climbs every year as mobile phones have just basically taken over uh, the telephone industry. So let's start our discussion about how network or, or how location works in a 911 call by reviewing the, the current state of 911, which is basically the phase two wireless, anti-alley phase two wireless. So most of you are probably familiar with how this works. Once you dial 911, uh, as that, that call is being processed, as soon as you ping three cell towers, um, they're able to triangulate the location of those cell towers, and they can uh, come up with a location. Now, the problem is that location is usually only accurate within 1,500 meters or 5,000 feet if you're not a, a, a meters and kilometers person. So 5,000 feet is not that accurate, and in many cases, you know, you've heard all the stories about uh, people that they couldn't find because the, act, uh, the location wasn't even close to where it, where it needed to be. So what's changed in the last few years is that Apple and Google got together and said, you know what, we can kind of figure out a pretty accurate device location where we don't need the cell towers, although they still use in some cases, the cell towers. And it's basically a tale of two approaches. So on one hand, you have the iOS operating system for all the Apple phones. And on the other hand, you have Android, which supports pretty much all the other uh, cell phone vendors, Samsung uh, and, and the rest of them. Google has their own uh, handheld device. So how does it work? We'll start with Apple. So basically what happens is Apple, at the time you dial 911, will go and look at your phone, and it'll see if you're connected to the GPS system. It'll look at your Bluetooth connection. If you're connected to Wi-Fi, there's, and most of you may or may not know that there's a couple of other sensors on your phone. One is a barometer to figure uh, height and altitude. The other one is an accel accelerometer, easy for me to say. Uh, that will, can tell if you're moving in one direction or another. And they also look at the cellular connections as well. So uh, Apple goes through and does a calculation that's called a hybridized emergency location, or HELO. You've probably heard that acronym before, HELO. That's uh, how uh, Apple calculates this uh, um, type of information. The goal of the HELO calculation is to have a low uncertainty, high integrity estimate of the device location. So from our experience using uh, the device location, uh, we see it's usually within 10 meters or 30 feet. So that's, that's a lot more accurate than 1,500 meters. And this is one of the reasons why people are anxious to get to a, um, a device-based location. So that's how Apple does it, and if you look at how Google does it, it's surprisingly similar. They look at the same kinds of information, the GPS, the Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi connection, the other sensors on the phone, barometer, 
accelerometer, and they also look at the cell phone connection. Their version of the calculation is basically a fuse location or hybrid location, and their goal is exactly the same. If you look at the white papers that both of these uh, companies published, they actually both use that term, calculate a low uncertainty, high integrity estimate of the device location. So those are the two main characters in this. We'll find out that there's a third alternative uh, that I'll, I'll talk about, but it's not used in the United States. We'll just talk about it for comparative purposes. So what's interesting is that this information, this device-based location, has been available in the U.S. since 2015. Now, Apple uh, basically uh, and Google offered this to, to all of the cellular car carriers like Verizon, AT&T, et cetera, um, and all they had to do was they, it was in response to a traditional network-induced location request, or NILR, um, and they basically had to go in and, uh, and issue that request However, um, those carriers that actually tried it, uh, they found that conditions would sometimes delay the uh, location being sent um, and that they had issues with updating alley servers with this new type of location. And so consequently, and of course, you know, uh, the cell phone providers are not that concerned about this type of information. They've got a lot of other things on their plate. So even though it, it was possible for any cellular uh, carrier to deliver this kind of handheld location, most of them didn't uh, or got frustrated in attempting to do it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at what are the various ways that device location is delivered. And here's where I introduce the third way that, that there's uh, device based uh, uh, location is calculated. And that's through something called AML, or Advanced Mobile Location. Now, AML was developed by the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, or ETSI, and it was the, an attempt to develop the same types of things that Apple and Google do from their device, uh, and it's primarily, uh, it's actually only available outside of the United States. So Latin America, Europe, Eastern Europe, et cetera, Asia, they use an AML approach. Um, and uh, basically, uh, in other countries, Carbine is the AML service provider uh, in places like Mexico and in Singapore and some other places in the world. Uh, and you may have heard AML thrown around as a generic uh, term for this kind of advanced mobile location, but technically AML is not available in the United States. So let's take a look at a little comparison at some of the characteristics. So with the um, technology that's used with a AML, it's transported, uh, uh, well, I should say it's AML for the uh, uh, Etsy organization. It's enhanced emergency data which is what uh, uses Hilo to calculate the device location on Apple. And in Google, it's the emergency location services that uses the fused or hybrid location to calculate the location. So with Etsy, or excuse me, with AML, the transport mechanism is the SMS service. Uh, the good news, one of the good news is, uh, with uh, AML is it doesn't require a data connection. So if you have a phone where you just have the voice and you haven't spent the extra money to have a data plan, uh, this will work uh, in the other parts of the world. And you can see the devices that, uh, when it came into existence, Android 4 and iOS 11, so it's been around for a while as well. With Apple, uh, they use a transport mechanism of HTTP, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a, in a minute. One of the benefits of using HTTP is that that message is, is actually encrypted as it's sent uh, from the device to your uh, 911 center. Since it's sent over HTTP in an IP type format, it does require a data connection. So if you have a phone that doesn't have a data connection, uh, then that location won't be sent. 
Uh, also, it requires iOS 12 and higher, which I think is, again, several years old. With Google, similar to Apple, they offer an encrypted data package, but they also have a fallback to SMS if you have an Android device. So if you have a data plan, it will use the encrypted HTTP transport mechanism to send the message. But if you don't have a data plan, it will still send the message, and it will use SMS to do that. And again, that's been around since Android 4.0 and higher. So again, some similar but slightly different approaches to getting to the same result. Um, there's some other information about these different um, uh, ways that the, the information gets sent. With AML, the location is only sent once, and you'll notice a little asterisk there. This can be adjusted by country, uh, and it depends on whether or not the emergency calls are free. So, for example, in Mexico, if you dial 911 and they send you an SMS, that you get charged for the SMS. So if, if I have AML there and I continuously send the location, I'm continuously charging the person's phone for another SMS message. You know, it would be terrible to have a, a, a kind of a tragedy and you're on the phone for a while and you, you get a $100 bill for your SMS messages. So they tend to send it only once uh, because it's sent over SMS. And obviously with Apple and Google, they will send the location um, uh, continuously or at least they set it up with the countries uh, ahead of time to say how frequently to send the location. And if the um, uh, 911 is a whitelisted number, then they tend to send it every few seconds because it's not, you're not going to be charged for that uh, in that country. Um, basically, uh, one of the other things is that uh, AML and uh, ELS from Google support multiple emergency numbers. Well, in the U.S., we only have one emergency number. But in other countries, you know, you have to dial a specific number for police, another number for EMS, another number for fire, et cetera. And so those are all supported uh, through AML with, uh, um, and also with, uh, with Google. Apple, on the other hand, only supports one emergency number, which would be 911 or whatever number per 112 in Europe. Um, and then um, the uh, next bit of information here, we always, uh, uh, the uh, AML and Google phones, Android devices, always send location for emergency calls. So if you dial 911 or 112 in the case of AML, they're always going to send the emergency location from the device. Now, with Apple, you have a choice on your Apple phone. If you go into your settings, there's a, a, a choice there that says, I don't want to send my location when I dial a, the emergency number. So you can opt out of having that location sent. I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but some people are, are worried about their privacy and things like that. So you can opt out with Apple. Uh, the other ones always send. The last thing is the kind of the payload, if you will, um, from the different approaches. Um, the AML has an SMS payload. Um, and the problem there, and we'll look at a little chart in just a minute, um, about the diff, uh, the the, the diff, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the, the different approaches. But with SMS, you have a limited message size, and it also is sent um, in a, uh, uh, a format that's unstructured. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a second. With Apple and Google, when you use the IP format or the HTTP send, uh, you have an unlimited data size. So this will become important later on uh, when we get into NG911 and we have things like ADR, which is the additional data repository, so you can accept more information and maybe more of this information will become important. And again, we'll look at some details on that a little bit later on. Remember also that Google, as a backup, if you don't have a data plan, will send the SMS as well. 
So those are some of the kind of subtleties, if you will. I want to shift gears a little bit and, and kind of look at the flow of the information as you make a call uh, to 911 using the different uh, formats, AML, Hilo, and ELS. So let's, let's take a look at that. So here you have your emergency. You've got a fire. You've got a panicked happy face. Uh, calls 911. The voice comes into the, uh, to the PSAP. Uh, the location via SMS in an AML environment is sent through the SMS gateway to some AML service provider. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in several countries, Carbine is this AML service provider similar to what Rapid SOS is in the U.S. We'll look at Rapid SOS in just a second. So this is just a managed service, so no one carrier has to manage it. An independent third-party vendor manages the service. So once that location hits the AML services, if you're using Carbine, it will pick that up and forward it to the uh, the uh, the call taker. Uh, the call taker uh, can, if they want to, they can do a rebid. Uh, in the case of Carbine, if you have that installed, we automatically rebid for you, so the call taker doesn't have to do anything additional. Uh, so that would be how it works with AML. And as I mentioned before, AML is not used in the United States, but pretty pretty prevalent in the rest of the world. So if you're traveling anywhere, you'll understand how the location works if you're in a foreign country. So let's take a look at Rapid SOS's clearinghouse. So basically, you've got the same initiation. You've got a call that comes into your PSAP. Um, at the same time, the um, location is automatically sent from the phone. Remember, you dial 911, the location, whether it's Google or Apple, we know there's some slight differences, but they send that using something called an HTTP-enabled location delivery or held uh, format, and it gets stored in Rapid SOS in the PIDAflow uh, format, uh, which is uh, I3 compliant um, according to NINA standards. So if it, once it's in the uh, Rapid SOS server, anyone that has that phone number so in the case of Carbine, if, if, we, if you were installed in your PSAP, we would automatically ping the Rapid SOS server for you so you don't have to use the, the little uh, uh, web uh, version that uh, Rapid SOS puts in your, uh, in your system. We'll do it for you automatically. And then we forward that on to the call taker. And as, as before, if you wanted to rebid uh, we can go and do that, and if you have Carbine, we do the rebidding for you automatically. Now, remember that Google and Apple both, if you have a data plan, they'll send it over the IP format using a held command, but if you don't have a data plan and you do have an Android device, right, you'll still have the, uh, it'll, it'll use the SMS uh, gateway to send that location to rapid SOS's clearinghouse. So um, that's a little snapshot of that. So you've got this SMS and HTTP kind of differentiator. Let's take a look at what those things are, or how those two approaches are different. So with SMS, it's uh, a subset of the SMS standard, and typically it's sent to a specific port on a device. But the big thing, the big difference with SMS is that it has a fixed size, a fixed message size when you send it out, and it's in a binary format rather than in a formatted text. So if you were a programmer, for example, and you had to deal with SMS, you have to create a lot of uh, parsing. You have to you know, kind of de dissect a string of what looks like random information, but maybe the first five bytes of the, or the first 10 bytes of the telephone number, the next two bytes or something else. So it's, it's, it's kind of esoteric and a little bit sticky in terms of how you have to deal with it on a programmatic side. But if you're dealing with a, uh, the held command or the HTTP uh, command, it comes in as a formatted message, and the information is sent in key value pairs. So 
in the message itself, and remember, it's encrypted as well. Uh, in the message itself, you, there's a header that says telephone number. And then the next bit of information is the telephone number. There is another one that says location. And, and the next bit of information is the location. So if you're dealing with this message, it's a, a lot clearer and easier to understand. Plus, it has unlimited length. And we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of both approaches in just a second. And we'll talk about some additional information that you might want to include in your message using HTTPS. So let's take a look here at the SMS advantages. First thing is it doesn't require a data connection. So I think most people, uh, if I was going to ask a kind of a, a query question of the audience, who doesn't have a data plan on their phone, I bet it would be zero. But uh, we could maybe discuss that at the end. Um, it is reliable. Most SMS, especially in the U.S. and some other countries where Carbine has customers, though, the SMS is not as reliable. Um, and uh, a, a small advantage is it doesn't show up in your SMS outbox, even though it's, it was sent from your phone. Um, so it doesn't look like a message on your, uh, on your system. When you look at HTTP, it's more secure because it, it goes across the wire as encrypted. Right. The other thing is it has an unlimited size. So in addition to the location information, um, it can also send things like altitude. It could send the device model of your phone, maybe whether that phone was a burner phone or a, a, a paid-for subscription uh, type of phone. And remember, with NG911 and the additional data repository, you know, in the future, uh, as you upgrade to EziNets and things like that, you're going to have a place to put all of this additional information. And if you have Carbine, we'll have a place to display all that information uh, in your call handling system. And as I mentioned earlier, it's easier to set up because it's got that value key pair in terms of how it works internally. So the disadvantage of SMS, more difficult to set up and, and, and program. Uh, and even though it's not visible to other apps, it's still not encrypted when it's sent over the network. So if you did have some kind of hacker or somebody, a man in the middle attack or whatever might be happening, uh, those things could be picked up and somebody could see the messages coming across uh, where that's not possible on the HTTP side. So the disadvantages with HTTP requires a data plan, which again, I think most people already have a data plan. Um, it's less reliable in certain countries. If you got a bad connection, you don't have the, the data. And if you got an Apple phone, there's no backup SMS. Um, and you know, it says here, you, it, sometimes it's unable to uh, acquire the M MSID SDN, easy for me to say, unless it's stored on your SIM card. So the, M, the, the MSI DSN is the Mobile Station International Subscriber Directory number, and it's the number used to identify your phone internationally. So that would only be a potential problem if you were in a different country or somebody was visiting here from another country. But if you stored that on your SIM card, then it's not, you know, it'll be available. The last disadvantage is uh, the HTTP does not work on CDMA networks. And the only two vendors in the U.S. that used to be CDMA was Sprint and Verizon. But I think after 4G, uh, those networks were de-emphasized. So you typically don't run into CDMA. And if you have a phone that doesn't have a SIM card, it's probably a CDMA phone. So if, if you know, you might want to upgrade your phone uh, if you haven't done that already. But most of that is is old, but it's not supported uh, with the HTTP delivery mechanism. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and talk about how this flows, this information of device location, how it flows with Carbine. So um, let's take a look at it. We still have our emergency call like we did before. Uh, the information comes into the PSAP, but now I have Carbine, so um, 
I have the option. Now, this is something that's important. If the caller is taking the call, and let's say, uh, you know, we, we said in the, on the, I think it was the third slide, we said that of the 911 calls, only 10 or 15% are actual legitimate emergencies, right? So with the carbine solution, if somebody calls in and it's, you know, they're talking to you about their cat missing, uh, you probably don't really care if you have their device location accurately at that time. But in our system, at the discretion of the call taker, um, the call taker can decide to uh, go in and send a SMS back to the caller to request their device location. And because with Carbine, we, we want to make sure we don't violate any um, uh, privacy laws, we always ask the caller for permission before we look at their video or or ask for their device location. So if the call taker says, yeah, you know, this is a real emergency and my location isn't as accurate as I want, I can go ahead and send that out to the caller, the SMS, asking for permission. As soon as I get that permission, uh, oh, there's one other point. As a backup, uh, we have also the ability to send a WhatsApp message uh, to the caller. Now, I know in the U.S., WhatsApp is not as popular, but in places like Mexico and other parts of the world, you know, 99% of the people have WhatsApp, and their SMS isn't as reliable in the U.S. So we use this as a backup mechanism, and Carbine is the only what they call green label provider of WhatsApp. And basically what that means is that we can send a WhatsApp message to you even though we're not a friend in your WhatsApp uh, directory book. So we can send this in an emergency situation. So we can send you both an SMS and a WhatsApp. You'll get both. If you, if you are here in the U.S. and you have both, you have WhatsApp on your phone, you'll get both uh, messages. You can pick either one uh, to reply back and give us permission. Once you've given us permission, then we send not only the location of the caller, but we also open up a live chat session and a video stream from your phone as well. And then obviously it, it hits our servers and then we send it back to the call taker. And unlike the other um, uh, services that we looked at, uh, you don't have to rebid. We automatically update the location every 10 seconds or every 10 meters if somebody's in a moving vehicle or they're walking or whatever the case might be. So the flow on the carbine system is similar, uh, except we also send additional information back to the, the PSAP. Now, in the middle of all of this is something that we call a communication platform as a service, right? And so this is our cloud-based uh, capability that enables us to not only deliver the video and the chat and the voice, we also, uh, with our solution, can do conferencing. So basically what that means is if you were a call taker and you made a call and sent a, uh, got the device location and the video and a chat session, and you said, wait a minute, this is really serious, i got to get uh, another, my supervisor involved and maybe the chief of police or the the fire chief involved, you could conference all of those people onto that same call. They would see the video. They would see uh, the chat session, and obviously you would have the voice as well. So that can be shared across multiple uh, involved uh, uh, persons uh, as, you, uh, as you need to uh, because of the way that we've orchestrated our, uh, our cloud solution. So let's take a little summary here of our uh, discussion about location, starting with landlines, which is the most boring because, first off, they're going away. Uh, but with landline, you only have the choice of Annie Alley, and we know that that's only uh, delivered through triangulation. And obviously, Carbine supports that along with all the other vendors in the, in the marketplace. When it comes to 911 calls, or in Europe, 112, then you have some different 
players in the uh, in the mix. You've got the Rapid SOS Clearinghouse, which if you have that, Carbine supports that, as do many other vendors in the marketplace. But then you have the uh, situation where maybe Rapid SOS didn't get the address, uh, and that's where Carbine and probably we, we see from the customers that we have in the U.S., between 3 to 10% of the calls, they need to ask for that location directly because it didn't either come through Annie Alley or it was too inaccurate or the Rapid SOS clearinghouse didn't pick it up either. So we, we are able to support that. No other vendor in the market gives you that capability. Um, the last category here is the um, admin calls. So 60% of the calls that come into the 911 center are through the admin line. Now, sometimes those are emergencies. So obviously, as we said before, unless you dial 911, the Rapid SOS clearinghouse doesn't get updated. With Carbine, 30 to 40% of those calls that come in on the admin line, we, we see through our customers' usage that they actively ping them for either a chat session the video or the location are all free because they have that option with the Carbine solution. Again, no other vendor provides that. And then Annie Alley obviously is not available because uh, just like uh, uh, the Rapid SOS, Annie Alley is not sent when you dial the admin line. So in addition to just location, with Carbine, again, we also include video, chat, and what, something that we call drop call protection, which is uh, the idea that you have, uh, when we connect with your phone, we open both a voice and a data channel. So if for some reason you, you lost your cellular connection on the, uh, the, uh, the voice, you would still have your data connection so you could see a video of what was going on. You could still chat with the user, and um, you would still have access to their video. So that is device location uh, in all of its forms. I'm sure that's a, a lot of information maybe that you were or were not familiar with. Um, and I, I have to plug the next seminar that's coming up on June 3rd, which is PSAP in Cloud. So how do you actually have call handling for 911 uh, in the cloud as opposed to in your cabinets in the back of your PSAP? So that's Wednesday, June 3rd, same time. And uh, I appreciate uh, everyone's time. Thank you, Paul. Um, I did have a question myself. Um, when you were talking about the, um, you were talking about the messaging, um, and you said that um, a message doesn't show up in your outbox in SMS. Are you saying that it doesn't show right. up on your phone's outbox? Correct. So when that message, okay. when when AML, uh, when AML or Google uses your F, uses F, the SMS transport to send a device location, you, you can't go into your, uh, your your text messages and see that your device location was sent to 911. It doesn't show up. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. And so the a lot of the stuff that you were talking about as far as like it's sending the device location and you were talking about the different formats and things like that, um, mm -hmm. these formats... Um, that it's using where you get um, you get the location um, and I it's uh, several screens back but um, and you're saying like there's you know the first few characters um, are talking about um, you know may say location or the first few characters may say phone number and then you get the phone number and then it says location and you get the location um, this is all stuff that's kind of happening in the background that it's telling your 911 system this information? So, yeah, so it, it, you're, you're referring to a, uh, a held command or the HTTP emergency location uh, um, uh, 
data. Yeah. And and, yeah. and so it's it's a it's a newer kind of standardized format than SMS. And because of that, it's more if you're familiar at all with XML, where you have a label than the data, a label than the data. If you've ever looked at any XML streams, it's it's formatted like that, where you have a label and then the data. So if you're looking at a message, it's easy to tell what data is what. If I looked at an SMS message, it would be a string, a 132 string character message. I don't know what's the phone number, what's the you know. So uh, until you parse it out, and, and of course they document, you know, the first ten bytes are this, the next three bytes are that, or whatever the case might be. And so the other uh, advantage of the uh, the help command is that it allows you to send additional data, you know, like the altitude and the and the phone uh, type and uh, the carrier and you know other information about the caller that's, that might be available through their phone. Okay, so, so I'm you, picturing again, this in my mind. Okay, so and the only thing I have to compare this to is say like the Annie Alley screen. Um, you yeah. know, it's formatted a certain way, and you know, certain pieces of information belong in a certain spot, and then right. it comes up like that, and it tells you what's the location, and it tells you who the carrier is and what the phone number is, and then it it um, it'll tell you the the X and the Y, um, you know, things like that. And so the, it so it it works similar to the way that the Annie Alley screen works, right? And you know that Annie Alley screen, okay. someone probably you know programmed that to give you nice displays and and nice uh, labels and all that kind of stuff. I'm I'm pretty sure it doesn't come in that yeah. way. Okay, but it's parsed out that way to us. Correct. Okay. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So um, I don't have any other questions yet. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, go ahead and send those in, and um, we'll be sitting here uh, patiently waiting. We'll leave this up for just a little bit so that um, anybody that has questions can uh, have time to do that. Um, and like Paul said, um, be sure and join us next month, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, for our next webinar, PSAP in the Cloud. And uh, remember, if you need information on today's lessons uh, for continuing education units, send an email to training at comelectronics.com. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us. This presentation has been made possible by Commercial Electronics provider of public safety solutions, including higher ground NG911 recording, CEQIP third-party quality assurance program, and Carbine 911 next generation call handling platform. So like I said, we'll leave this up for a few minutes if you have questions. Otherwise, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul.